edition, my book, Soil Soul Society. That book is just now reprinted uh, from uh, United States. And the publisher is Parallax Press. And so if you are interested, uh, please look out for Soil Soul Society. Um, today, it is my pleasure to speak about learning from nature and learning in nature. At the moment, we see nature as inferior and humans as superior. We think that nature is there only as a resource for the economy. Nature is inanimate. Nature has no living quality. Nature is inanimate. And nature is there only to make profit, to make money, and a means to an end. Now, I want our education to change that. And I want our education to think that nature is not inferior to humans. Humans and nature are one. Humans are also nature. At the moment, we think of nature as mountains, forests, animals, rivers, birds, all that nature. And humans, not nature. This is a first big mistake. We are nature. We are as much nature as animals and forests and rivers and mountains and birds are nature. We are all made of four elements. Earth, air, fire, water. Everything is made of those four elements. So, we are human beings. You know the word human? The word human comes from Latin word humus. And if you look at your etymological dictionary, you will find that humus means soil. So human beings are literally soil beings. We are soil. Our body is soil transformed. The food we eat, the mangoes, the bananas, the oranges, the bread, the rice, the vegetables, the herbs, they are all made of soil. Soil transformed. And so we human beings are soil beings. We are nature. So that's the first thing. If you want to learn from nature, and you want to change your educational system, all our universities and all our schools need to teach children and young people that we are all nature. And therefore, what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. That's the first thing. Nature has intrinsic value. We talk about human rights. We also have to talk about rights of nature. Rivers have rights. Forests have rights. Animals have rights. They have as much right to live, to survive, and to thrive as humans. And so rights of nature have to be taught in our schools, in our universities. At the moment, we go to university or school, all our education is very academic. And all the money we spend on education, running hundreds of thousands or millions of schools and universities around the world, they are training only head. Academic education is only about intellectual education. And only half head. Because we have two hemispheres of the brain. The left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. So our education is all about left hemisphere. Half brain. The left hemisphere is about science, 
technology, management, administration, calculation, measurement. That's a left hemisphere of the brain. The right hemisphere is intuition, imagination, creativity, poetry, music, relationship. So our universities don't pay much attention to the right hemisphere of the brain. Only the left hemisphere. And then our universities and schools don't pay any attention to the rest of the body. Our universities think that children and young people have no body. They have only brain, half brain, half head, no body. I want that to change. I want our education should be education of whole body. Education of head and both hemispheres of the head, both hemispheres of the brain. And education of heart, cultivating compassion, cultivating kindness, cultivating generosity, cultivating magnanimity. All these are hard qualities. Our education does not cultivate heart, only brain. And then I want education of hands. Our education and our universities and our schools don't teach children how to grow food. I would like every school in the world to have a garden. Children should learn to plant the seeds. Children should learn to see the how you plant the smallest of the small tomato seed in the soil. And that small tomato seed has potential to become a big plant. And that big plant has many leaves. And then it comes blossom. It's a beautiful blossom. From that one seed of tomato, just imagine, hundreds of blossoms. And each blossom turns into a fruit. A, a green tomato first, small green tomato. Then with the sun and the rain, that green tomato becomes yellow and the yellow tomato becomes red and that big tomato with tremendous taste, nutrition, fragrance and, and, and healthy food. What a miracle. Our children need to learn that. They need to see it. They need to experience it. In our big cities like London, Beijing, New Delhi, New York, Paris, Tokyo, all these big cities. Children think the tomatoes come in a, a plastic packet in a supermarket. They have no idea. So learning from nature is to learning by planting seeds, planting, planting potatoes, tomatoes, cucumber, cauliflower, cabbage, asparagus, onions, carrots, and much more. That is learning from nature and learning about nature and learning in nature. So every school in the world, every university in the world should have a garden or a farm. Then you can learn from nature. If you don't go in nature, if you don't see nature, have no experience of nature, how can you learn from nature? You are only reading about nature on a, in a book, pictures, or you are looking on the screen. That's not learning from nature and learning in nature. So I would like to see education of head, education of heart, education of hands, and children learning to grow food and make things, make things. Human beings are not simply consumers. Human beings are makers. You know the word poet? What does poet means? Not just somebody who can make beautiful words, put beautiful words on a page of poetry. That is poetry. That is poet. 
But poet is a bigger word. It's a Greek, Greek word, poet. And poet means maker. When you make something with your own imagination, with your own creativity, with your own heart, whatever you make, with your own creativity and imagination, then you are a poet. I want to see every child becoming a poet. Every young person in a university becoming a poet. Learning to use and cultivate imagination. That is my ideal of education. At the moment, education is very, very narrow. We are educating our young people only to get a job. Job is not the same as work. You do a job because you want to earn money. Just to earn money. Whether you like it or not. Whether you enjoy your work or not. Because you need money. You need to uh, pay the bills. You need to pay the rent. You need to pay for clothes and shoes and, and furniture and food. And so you need money. So you do something. If you are paid, that's fine. I don't think that is good enough. I want people not to just have a job, but have work. And work is something which you do because you want enjoying it. And you get money as a byproduct. I'm not against money. But I am against people working for money. You can earn money, but work for something you enjoy doing. Something inspiring. Something helpful. Something regenerative. Something which sustains and maintains the, the ecology of the earth. Keeps our rivers clean. Keeps our forests alive. Keeps our atmosphere good. Keeps our humanity good. Something good. That's a work. Good work. Not just job. So I would like all our children to learn to work to earn a right livelihood. Right livelihood is very different from getting a job and just uh, doing a job just to earn money and whether you like it or not. I think we need to teach children how to enjoy your work and how to make it creative and how to make it helpful and how to make it a service. So that is my vision for education. So learning from nature and going out in nature and being in nature is an essential part of education. I would like our schools to have maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the classroom. But at least one day, Friday, should be outdoor classroom. Leave the school. Go out of the classroom. And go out in nature. Climb the trees. Climb the mountains. Swim in the river. There's a learning. You're learning from nature when you are swimming in the river. And planting trees. And protecting environment and ecology. And learning about ecology. Not just about money, but ecology. That's a learning about nature. Learning from nature. Nature is our teacher. Nature's economy of nature is the most beautiful economy in the world. The economy of nature has no waste, no pollution. Just look at the packaging system of, of nature. The orange, beautiful segments of the orange. It's packaged in a beautiful orange color. And you take that packaging and put it on the compost. No waste, no pollution. It becomes soil again. Banana inside, you eat. But the skin outside, beautiful, soft, organic, put back into the soil. That becomes soil again. So economy of nature is a cyclical economy. It moves the cycle. Where the industrial economy is linear economy. You dig, you mine, you take from nature, you use it and you throw it away. Plastic, pollution, waste, carbon emission, global warming, climate change. So much waste and pollution and, and contamination of the environment and nature. 
So our education at the moment, at the moment, is anti-nature, anti-life. Our education teaches children to love concrete, to love plastic, to love or, or be part of waste and pollution. That is not education. That is a miseducation. And so learning from nature is to respect nature, love nature, maintain nature, sustain nature, and do whatever you are doing as nature does, which means everything must come from nature, use it, and put it back in nature. That is the lesson of nature. So I can go on talking about nature, and therefore I say you read my book, Soil, Soul, Society. So that's where soil is the first. Nature, soil is the first. And the soil and nature is alive. Soil is conscious. Soil is not dead, inanimate. It's an animate earth. Anima mundi. Anima mundi, animate earth. Living organism. Gaia, the beautiful word Gaia. Greek word Gaia. James Lovelock made Gaia as a new science of the earth. So we should revere Gaia. We should revere our earth, Mother Earth. Earth is not dead, rock. Earth is a living organism. Nature is a living organism, conscious. Consciousness is not just a human domain. Consciousness is, uh, is uh, everywhere. Trees are conscious. Animals are conscious. Birds are conscious. Soil is conscious. We are made of soil. Humans are conscious. So, so earth, soil, nature is alive. It has soul. It has consciousness. The Rupert Sheldrake, another great scientist, says nature has a memory. A mango tree knows. A mango seed knows how to become a mango and not an orange or not an apple but a mango. They remember. The seed remembers to become a tree again and, and become mango again. So that is my vision for learning from nature and revering nature and seeing ourselves as nature. If we can do that, that will be a, a new revolution in education. At the moment, our education is anti-life and anti-nature. And we are dominating nature. We are controlling nature. We are exploiting nature. We are polluting nature. We are wasting nature. It's all anti-nature. We, are, as if any, any, uh, and nature is our kind of um, subjugation. It's a human colonialism. It's a human colonialism that we are colonizing nature for human benefit, as if humans are the rulers of the earth. We are not rulers of the earth. We are part of the earth, integral part of the earth. If we can have that new consciousness and we can learn from nature, be humble towards nature, then I think we can have a new kind of education. Thank you for listening to me and my words. And I would like a bit of time so that we can have some Q&A. If you, you might like to challenge me or you might like to disagree with me. And you might like to say, no, no, nature is not animate and nature is not alive and we have to exploit nature for human benefit and humans are superior to nature. If you have that view, please challenge me. But ask any question you would like to ask. But I thank you and I wish you a great success for your conference. Thank you. Q&A time. Can you put the gallery so that I can see everybody's face, please? Yeah, good. That's good. Gallery. Okay, any question? Please raise your hand. Hey, yes, uh, hi, Dai. You, you have raised the hand. Ask. Uh, Thank you, sir. You, you're very, uh, most definitely very, very passionate about about the message. And that's what we want to say thank you. And love it when, you know, as from one human to another, where we can sense passion and and transfer that energy across and to inspire. I wanted to ask you, like, there's a lot of things that, you know, in the, in the nature realm that 
uh, you know, that we are, we are, we are doing, which is like from biomimicry, uh, which is, you know, trying to copy nature and all types of designs. And then we also now like, even at the uh, technology level where we have free energy principles, where we look at uh, uh, algorithm of nature through science and mathematics, and uh, I mean, through science and chemistry and physics uh, to be able to um, uh, learn from nature and, you know, the yes. mimic nature. So do, in, in your experience, uh, and, and do you have, like, let's say with the soil, do you have some form of framework or some form of, uh, um, I don't know what's the question. So, yeah, it's a form yes, of framework. Yes. I think I think biomimicry is a very good framework. I like uh, biomimicry, and the person who wrote the book biomimicry called Janine Benyus, she is an American scientist, and she's a good friend of mine, and uh, and she came to teach at Schumacher College, so she was she's one of our teachers. And so what she is saying, and I think I totally agree with that, that we need to learn from nature, copy, mimic nature, how nature works, and how, as I mentioned, uh, packaging of nature, for example, we have to learn from nature and see whatever packaging we should do, we should go back in nature and, and be biodegradable and be compostable so that there's no waste and no pollution. So I think if we can use biomimicry as our guide, as a framework, I think that'll be very good. But I think, I mean, you can also go a little bit further and you can say uh, that nature is a living organism. Nature is conscious. Nature has a soul. Nature has a spirit. And we are all nature. So it's a kind of going a little bit step further but I like very much, uh, Janine Benyus is a good friend of mine, and I like the bi idea of biomimicry very much. And if you have not read the book, Biomimicry um, by Janine Benyus, it's worth reading. And I think she might have even a new book, and she's also on a YouTube. And so I think you can, you can follow biomimicry uh, uh, nicely, and that would be a very good idea. So I, I yeah, totally yeah. support biomimicry. Now, yeah, Vanessa, yeah. you have a question, Vanessa? Yes, I uh, thank you, sir, for your passionate speech. Um, I have a question about concerning the contrast of uh, this new generation uh, that is um, mm, contained into these small spaces, you know, where everything has become even the shorter, 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 uh, uh, how do you say, attention span? because of yes. uh, the way everything is being presented yeah. and also the way they're being trained unconsciously through all the things that are happening in the digital uh, world. So yeah. this in contrast to what nature brings, which is, of course, this whole process is the, you know, the following of one tree during a whole season to see what happens and to be able to tune into that. So my question is, how can you bridge this generation's lack of, con uh, yeah, lack of, patience let's say how can you bridge these two worlds together how can you get, help them get there and have yes the I, it's patience. a very good question vanessa very good question uh i think how we do it we have to change our education that's the, okay. this is why this conference is about how to change education we have to teach our children that there are two things in the world which are not short of one is time and the other is space at the moment in our industrial age, we think there's no sh enough time, shortage of time. Everything has to be in two minute or three minute video. You can, don't have no time to read a book. You don't have time to listen to a proper speech. You have to have everything in sound bite. When God made time, he or she made plenty of it. Time is eternal. There's no shortage of time. So whatever you are doing, just do it properly. At the moment we build houses. Houses are built prefab, pre prefab um, kind of material, and we build a house within a week or 10 days or two weeks. That's too short. We should build a house which is beautiful, which will last for hundreds of years, it's made well, crafted well, and it's nicely made. 
we, we write a book. We should write a book with properly. I took I took six months to write a book, Soil Soul Society. And so mm -hmm. when God made time, he or she made plenty of it. There's no shortage of time. This is what we need to teach our children. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the space. We think mm -hmm. of always real estate. It's very it's, it's, it's kind of expensive. We have put a value on space. Space is infinite. There's no lack of space. We need to be frugal. We need to be restrained. Of course, that is another quality. But space is not limited. So space and time are unlimited. And so we should we should be generous. We should be magnanimous. And we should have plenty of time for our friends, plenty of time to dance, plenty of time to write poetry, plenty of time to sing, plenty of time to cook, plenty of time to garden, plenty of time to go walking. This morning, I went for two hours walking before coming to this conference. And the beautiful sun, there's no shortage of sun, there's plenty of sun. Even in England, we have plenty of sun. So this idea of shortage is only because of capitalist industrialist system. And we want to mm -hmm. make money. And therefore, we, you pay one hour, how much will you charge? 500 pounds or $200 or $500. So you put everything a monetary value. So all, also on time. You, you value time in terms of money, and therefore you become shortage. And then you say space, real estate, just kind of uh, 100 feet um, wide space for one house. And this is so much. In New York, it's so much. In London, so much. In Delhi, so much. So all this, uh, we are driven by money. And this is why we have shortage of time. And, and the attention span is shorter. And therefore, we are bringing everything closer and closer and closer. So I would like to have a generosity of spirit magnanimous spirit, there's plenty of time, plenty of food, plenty of generosity. Nature is abundant. If you want to learn from nature, nature is abundant. You plant, I mentioned tomato seed. One tomato seed you plant and abundant, that one tomato seed will produce 100 tomatoes and each tomato will have 20 more seeds. So from one tiny tomato seed, you can create a whole orchard of tomatoes. One apple seed mm. can produce a whole orchard of apples. Nature is abundant. The shortage of time, shortage of, of, of space, shortage of love, shortage of anything is a, a very capitalist and a very industrial and very consumerist idea. We should mm. abandon that. And we should say there's abundance of everything and just enjoy your life. Be frugal, be frugal, of course. Don't waste anything, but there is no shortage. Abundance is the nature's uh, nature's quality. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are welcome. Okay, um, uh, Clement, you have a question? Great. Thank you so much for your abundance of passion. And you've started the Q&A inviting us to disagree and to confront you. And I just wanted to say, when you say that we should go to school for a day and then on Friday go out in nature, what I'm seeing around here is that school are giving themselves a pat on the back. They're like, yeah, but kids spend one block outside. But then the whole rest of their curriculum is still so industrial. So I think that we need to fundamentally shift the roots of our educational system. And having heard a lot about Schumacher College and how you try to adhere to a shift of values, a shift of our vision of time, a shift of our vision of relationship to space, I was curious to hear a little bit about kind of the founding story of Sch Schumacher and how you've done so to adhere to other values. Yes, yes. I mean, when I said at least one day, at least, not I'm saying that only one day, but minimum, at, at the moment, five days a week are in the classroom. So I say at least one day children should go out in nature. But if you can do two days or three days or four days or five days, even better, because I think we should have forest schools and the school should be in the forest. And our traditional Indian culture, all our schools used to be in the forest. Even the Rama, uh, our god Rama, went to forest to learn from the great rishis. So, so I agree with you that if we can do more, that's better. But at least minimum one day a week should be in nature. That's my idea. But Schumacher College, we started Schumacher College particularly with two very important um, things to do. One is deep ecology, and the second is Gaia. So deep ecology was the kind of philosophy, Arne Ness. He came to teach at Schumacher College, Arne Ness from Norway. He's a Norwegian philosopher. He wrote a book called Deep Ecology. And then Gaia. 
that's a James Lovelock. He was our teacher and the, one of the first teacher. Uh, and he talked about how Earth, the living organism, and how Earth is a kind of um, uh, kind of uh, uh, conscious and, and a kind of soulful. And, and we should revere uh, Gaia. And so that came, but how do we do it? Our, our students have head, heart, and hands. And so everybody spends some time in the garden. We have a rota, and in that rota, all students have to work in the garden to learn from nature. Without working in the garden, there is no Srimakar College course. Srimakar College course must involve working in the garden. Secondly, all our students have to learn cooking. Cooking, gardening, and then cooking. Bringing your vegetables and your fruit, bringing it in the kitchen, and preparing it with love and care, and then eating together. All our students and teachers eat together as a, as a community. That's a, that's a fundamental. And then we all do our work, like cleaning, washing, uh, washing up uh, our dishes, and all that kind of thing we do together. So that uh, head, heart, and hands. And then we are living, living in a community. So community is a very important part of Shri College. And then we take our students out in nature, on the Dart Moor, or, or the Dart River, or, or by the sea, and a deep time walk. And Stepan Harding was one of our teachers who just passed away for 35 years. He was our teacher. Uh, uh, and he was uh, an inventor of deep time walk. And so how evolution has brought us uh, humans to this place and how we are part of this great evolution and, and, and how we should be humble uh, in that evolutionary uh, status. And then I teach there. Uh, with the um, Soil Soul Society, the new trinity. So therefore, our education is very integral. Head, heart, and hands, learning from nature, doing everything, practicing, not just learning intellectually, but putting that in experience. Knowledge and experience must go together. Only knowledge is not enough. Knowledge must be tested through experience. And that is why uh, we, we, uh, we put our uh, students uh, by working in the garden and working, uh, working in the kitchen and going out uh, uh, on the Dartmoor or by the river and being in nature. That's our uh, system of education. Thank you. Okay, so next question is Asato Umi from Japan. Please ask your question. Thank you, Juan. We will go to Greg yes. Nelson after you. Okay. Amazing energies and uh, like uh, I I know Kai and then um, actually I joined the uh, Kai session yesterday in India, but this is the last day, so I couldn't meet you. I hope meet you soon. Uh, my question yeah. is about uh, uh, for example, if you meet some teacher who are totally under the system of the matrix and have no. Uh, idea for connection with nature or spirit and then they think this is the only way to live so if you meet such a people or maybe it can be teacher how do you open that people's consciousness to the connection like uh, because people misunderstanding the like uh, breaking the social system is their home but actually your home is this planet the oceans and the the flowers like uh, trees so how do you open the some people's consciousness who totally apart from this kind of consciousness yes yes, yes. um you open it by not just a teacher but by in india we have a word for a teacher for guru and the guru is not just intellectual teacher guru is somebody who is an embodiment of the philosophy that he or she is teaching. And therefore, you have to shift from being a teacher to being a guru. There is no word in English uh, to translate the word guru. Guru is somebody who is embodiment, who is radiating the philosophy that he or she is teaching. And therefore, at the moment, we, our teachers, are just intellectual teachers. They are not embodiment of their philosophy or their, uh, their, their ideas. And so, um, you have to radiate. You have to radiate. Like a, a radiator warms the room. If a teacher is radiating, then that, that teacher will really impress, influence, inspire uh, many, many people. 
So at the moment, our teaching uh, profession has become too professional and too limited, just intellectual information and intellectual knowledge uh, and, and passing to your students without being radiating, without being embodiment. So that's how you do it. We have to create a new uh, training, a new learning uh, kind of approach uh, to train teachers in a way that they become embodiment. They become gurus. And if you can become a guru, I think Zen masters in uh, in Japan who are gurus, they practice what they are teaching. And then Thich Nhat Hanh, for example, a Buddhist teacher, he was a guru and he was teaching and he inspired people. He, he really changed people's consciousness and people's minds. So we need many, many gurus of that nature who embody and a and, and, and pass. I am I'm very much coming, hoping to, I'm very much coming to Japan uh, in the beginning of November, I'll be in Japan for 10 days. And uh, my book, Radical Love, it has been now published in Japanese. And so uh, if you are by any chance anywhere near where I'm speaking, uh, please come and listen to me and meet me in Japan. I'll be there from the 1st to the 12th of November. Thank you very much. Okay, next go to Greg Nelson. What is your question, Greg? Hi, thank you. Um, well, speaking of... Uh people who impress and inspire you're certainly one of them and i was so pleased to hear about your new effort to revitalize uh schumacher's also yes. speaking of schumacher um and i'm wondering if there's uh lessons that you have drawn from um you know how things have have unfolded there in the past and you know what if you're if you are successful with the new effort like what your vision for the new institution is? Will it still be place-based? Will it be a global network? Uh, some combination? Those kinds of questions. Yes, thank you very much. That's a good question. Uh, Schumacher College was supported and, and a, a kind of uh, funded by Dartington Hall Trust for the last um, 25 years. And so now that is changing. And, and the Dartington Hall is withdrawing their uh, support from Schumacher College. So now we are working to create a new Schumacher College, Schumacher College um, 2.0. And so that is that is our idea. So we will we are going to get a new place, a new location, and that will be our home again. Uh, so we are going to move the location as well. Uh, but our idea is to create a university of the future. The university of the future will not be just one place, but university of the future will be a decentralized um, network of many, many learning centers around the world. So we are going to create a network uh, of uh, learning centers in India, in America, in Japan, in China, in, in Australia, in Africa, wherever, Europe, wherever. The people who are learning about ecology, about Gaia, about deep ecology, about a holistic science, um, about the spiritual and uh, consciousness, all these uh, kind of holistic uh, ideas. There are many, many people and many, many centers are doing it, but they are all isolated, disconnected. They don't connect with each other. They don't support each other. So we want to create a new university of the future. Shumaka College will be a new university of the future where we will be all like, sharing ideas, decentralized, not any one uh, funding body, decentralized, self-funded, self-managed, but sharing our values and our vision and our ideals uh, of, of ecology, deep ecology, Gaia, etc., etc. So that is our new vision. And, and if any of you are really interested, please uh, connect with me and let me know if you have any uh, center which you want to join or any other uh, way uh, to be part of this new vision for Schumacher College. And also we are looking for some funding uh, to create this new college, new university of the future. So any of you have some spare cash, please contact me and let, support support this new idea. Uh, but, um, but we are working towards a new vision at a Schumacher, um, Schumacher 2.0 new vision, new Schumacher College, the rebirth of Schumacher College. And we want you all to be part of this new journey, a new journey, a new pilgrimage of love. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. So okay. Much. I think we um, are coming to uh, sort of end yeah. of our time. Um, yes. We have... Um, I wonder if there's a way, I know that Namali still has their hand up. Is there a way that folks could possibly reach you 
Um, if we don't get so you to... can you can give my email to anybody. It's all free. Uh, Satish at resurgence.org. Wonderful. Satish at resurgence.org. So anybody wants to connect with me, ask any questions, support, or start Shima College in your own place, uh, please contact me. And good luck. Or we need a new revolution in our educational system. And bringing yeah. earth-centered, nature-centered education is our challenge. Not money-centered, not job-centered, but life-centered, nature-centered, earth-centered, human-centered. Those are the big visions and big values. And we have many, many great teachers in our world in the past, like Rabindranath Tagore, um, um, Masanobu Fukuoka in Japan, and, and many other, uh, James Lovelock, Ami Ness, Wendell Berry, Gary Snyder, Vandana Shiva, Fritjof Capra, all these wonderful teachers we have, and we want to build on that foundation. So thank you very much for inviting me and giving me a chance to share my ideas together. Thank you. Mm -hmm.